Welcome to the deep dive. We're here to sift through the noise, pull out the key insights, the surprising facts just for you. That's right. Today, we're tackling The Economist's July 26, 2025 issue. Quite a bit in there. Oh, absolutely. It's packed. Our job is to distill it down, give you that informed edge without you having to read every single page. Exactly. Think of it as your shortcut to knowing what matters. We've got AI, finance, global politics, some really surprising social trends. And even things like uh, restaurant reservations and IKEA textiles. It's mm -hmm. a really broad sweep. It really is. So let's get into it. This deep dive is tailored for you, the listener. Where should we start? Maybe the digital frontier. Sounds good. AGI seems like the obvious place. Right. Artificial general intelligence. It's creating a massive amount of buzz, maybe some nervousness, too. Definitely both. People are comparing its potential impact to, you know, the printing press, the steam engine, mm. even electricity. What yeah. makes it feel so revolutionary now? Well, part of it is just the sheer amount of money pouring in. You've got Microsoft, Google, Meta, OpenAI, and Thropic. Yeah. They're all investing Billions. Billions. Wow. Yeah. And the core challenge they're all wrestling with, according to the sources, is this thing called the alignment problem. Okay, alignment. What does that actually mean? It's basically trying to make sure that these incredibly powerful AIs have goals that actually line up with human values, with our safety. It sounds technical, but it's deeply philosophical, too. How do you code human values? Exactly. That's the multi-billion dollar question, isn't it? How do you ensure safety when human values themselves are so varied and, frankly, sometimes contradictory? It's less a programming puzzle and more a massive societal challenge. And it's already cropping up in unexpected places, right? Like, I saw the piece on Google DeepMind's Aeneid project, translating ancient texts. Uh-huh. That's fascinating. Yeah. We're talking Latin, Sumerian, Babylonian, things humans struggle to decipher. And he is opening up new windows into history. So it's not just about science and tech. It could change how we understand the humanities. Absolutely. It prompts that bigger question. How do we make sure these tools are used for, you know, broad discovery and understanding, not just for narrow, maybe commercial goals? And then there's the economic side. Huge potential for productivity boosts, mm -hmm. but also the fear of significant job losses, labor displacement. Right. And economists are looking at this through different lenses. There's Bommel's cost disease idea. OK, break that down a bit. So. The idea is that even if AI makes manufacturing super efficient, the cost of services that still need a lot of human input, like healthcare, education, maybe even haircuts, right? those costs might rise disproportionately yeah. because they don't get the same productivity gains. The barber still takes about the same time, right? right? So that creates an imbalance. Exactly. Or others see AI as a general purpose technology like steam power that can just lift everything eventually. The real challenge is managing that transition so the benefits are shared widely. Hmm. Huge questions. Okay, let's shift from digital mines to digital money. Stable coins. There's this new U.S. law, the Genius Act, signed by President Trump. What's the big deal with stable coins? Well, stable coins are basically digital currencies, but they're pegged to a stable asset usually a traditional currency like the U.S. dollar. So not like Bitcoin jumping all over the place. Exactly. They aim for stability and the benefits. They promise much faster, much cheaper payments. Think about sending money overseas. It can take days and cost a fair bit. Yeah. Stable coins could potentially do that in minutes for a fraction of the cost. We're talking maybe 0.5% fee versus like 2.5% for a credit card. Wow. That's a big difference. It's huge. And it opens doors for financial inclusion, for people who don't have easy access to traditional banks. The real disruption might be forcing banks to totally overhaul their old systems. And it's already happening globally. The article mentioned Nigeria, Turkey. Yeah, people are using them there to get around high inflation or strict currency controls. It's like a financial workaround becoming mainstream. But there must be risks, right? Oh, absolutely. Big risks. What if the stablecoin loses its peg? You could have the digital equivalent of a bank run. Okay. Plus, concerns about money laundering, terrorist financing, and the potential for a whole shadow financial system outside of normal regulation. So who controls it? Central banks. Private companies. That's the massive debate right now. It really gets to the heart of who controls money in the digital age. And this connects to the broader idea of tokenization, putting real-world assets onto blockchains. Precisely. Think of things like real estate, art maybe even company shares, being represented as unique digital tokens on a blockchain. Okay, so what does that do? It could fundamentally change ownership. 
Imagine buying or selling a fraction of a building almost instantly, transparently, without needing lots of intermediaries like lawyers and brokers. It promises much greater efficiency and clarity in how assets are owned and traded globally. Okay, mind-bending stuff. Let's pivot now to global security, nuclear weapons. The U.S. is reportedly spending, what was it, $1.4 trillion on modernizing its arsenal. Yeah, the, the nuclear triads, the missiles in silos, the subs, the bombers. It's a huge undertaking. Why now? What's the driver? Well, the core concept is deterrence. Making sure your capabilities are credible enough to prevent an attack. But verification's getting harder. China's expanding its arsenal rapidly. Russia's modernizing, too. The sources mentioned a global total around 9,200 warheads. 9,200. That's sobering. It is. A lot of this U.S. spending is about ensuring a second strike capability, being able to retaliate even after being hit first. That's seen as key to stability, ironically. But it raises that constant question. How do you balance security needs with the risk of proliferation or just... Accident. Miscalculation. Exactly. And that's where it gets really worrying, especially as the article touches on when you think about new tech like AI potentially playing a role in command and control systems down the line. The margin for error is zero. Yeah, absolutely terrifying. Okay, let's turn to a really pressing human issue. Migration and refugees. The UK's policy of deporting migrants to Rwanda is mentioned. Highly controversial. Extremely. It's raised serious questions under the UN Refugee Convention about legality and ethics. And it's just one example. We're seeing massive, complex migration flows across Europe, Africa, the Middle East. Different countries trying different things. Right. Denmark, for instance, focusing more on attracting skilled labor. It highlights this global tension between national sovereignty, economic needs, and humanitarian obligations. There's no easy answer. And this ties into conflict zones. The situation in Gaza, the article highlights Hamas's tunnels as being central to the conflict. Yes, and the devastating impact on civilians. Those tunnels cause immense suffering, displacement. They're not just military assets, they trap people. There was that story of Omer. Right, escaping after 50 days underground in a 12-meter deep tunnel. Yeah. It's just, it shows the sheer desperation. How do you even begin to provide aid and protect people caught in that kind of situation? It seems almost impossible. And elsewhere, other conflicts simmer or flare up. Eastern Congo, the M23 rebels, Uganda's involvement. It's a reminder of ongoing regional instability in parts of Africa. The very complex web, yes. Okay, let's bring it closer to home, politically speaking. Former President Trump's legal issues are covered. Quite a few different cases mentioned. Yes, the sources cover allegations related to sex trafficking, business fraud, the January 6th investigations. It's important to note, as the reporting does, that these are ongoing legal processes. Right. Impartial reporting is key here. Absolutely. There are obviously strong opinions on whether these are politically motivated or legitimate legal actions. But the focus in the source material is on the judicial proceedings themselves. It highlights that tension between law and politics in a polarized time. Meanwhile, in Japan, a potential shift. Shigeru Ishiba challenging the ruling LDP. That's interesting, yes. It signals perhaps a desire for change, even within a system that's been dominated by one party for so long. It shows how even stable political landscapes face pressures to adapt. And speaking of social dynamics, Britain, that survey finding was quite stark. 74% expecting riots, only 4% identifying with multiculturalism. Yeah, that data points to some real underlying tensions. Mm -hmm. Perceptions about immigration levels, maybe economic anxiety, plus that historical context of past riots, 1918, 1958, 1981. It suggests a complex, maybe even fractured sense of national identity right now. It's not a simple picture. Definitely not. Then there's that almost unbelievable story of identity theft in the U.S., William Woods living as Matthew Kieran's for decades. Incredible, isn't it? Yeah. And Matthew's struggle to reclaim his actual identity, it just shows the devastating personal cost of that kind of fraud. It's not just financial. It's losing your entire life, your history, and then facing this bureaucratic nightmare to get it back. Truly chilling. <laughs> okay, let's shift to the economy again more broadly. Global trade is facing headwinds. The Panama Canal drought is mentioned. Yes, that's a big one. Less water means fewer ships, bigger queues. Combine that with the Houthi attacks disrupting shipping in the Red Sea. So ships are going the long way around Africa. Exactly. Longer routes, higher fuel costs, delays. Mm -hmm. It all adds up and contributes to global inflation. It really shows how vulnerable these critical trade arteries can be. And this is happening alongside a rise in trade protectionism generally. It seems so. Countries are rethinking global supply chains, 
maybe prioritizing resilience or national security over pure efficiency. It's that classic debate, hmm. free trade versus protecting domestic industries. We're seeing a definite shift in the balance. Interesting. And within the U.S., talk of big rail mergers, Norfolk Southern and CSX. Right. They're looking for efficiency, greater market share. But these kinds of huge mergers always face tough scrutiny from regulators over competition and potential monopoly power. It's a high-stakes game. Okay, let's look at some specific industries in emerging economies, China and electric vehicles. They seem dominant. Absolutely dominant. Companies like BYD are huge, not just domestically, but increasingly exporting worldwide. They've had massive government support, and it's paid off. They are setting the pace globally now. It's reshaping the whole auto industry. Fundamentally. And in Asia generally, a boom in private jets, particularly China. Uh huh. It's a sign of rapidly growing wealth, obviously, but also a demand for convenience and efficiency in travel for business elites. Even with challenges like airspace restrictions, the demand is there. Meanwhile, in Bangladesh, a different kind of transport revolution. E-rickshaws. Yeah, they're everywhere in some cities. They're affordable, much cleaner than old diesel auto rickshaws. Huge benefits. But there's a downside. A big one. Safety. They're largely unregulated, often poorly built or maintained. Drivers might be untrained. And tragically, this leads to a lot of accidents, injuries, even deaths. It's that difficult balance between grassroots innovation and necessary regulation. Hmm. A tough challenge. And in the Gulf states, still trying to move beyond oil. Very much so. They know the oil won't last forever or the demand will eventually fall. So they're pouring money into renewables, technology, tourism, logistics, trying to build diversified, sustainable economies for the future. It's a massive strategic pivot. Makes sense. Back in the U.S., the labor market, job hopping is slowing down. Yeah, it seems a frenzy is cooling. Higher interest rates are biting. The economy's maybe not growing as fast. Employers aren't quite as desperate for workers as they were. So people are staying put more. Generally, yes. And that tends to moderate wage growth, too. It suggests the labor market is finding a bit more balance, maybe shifting some power back towards employers. Now, something that affects many of us, airfares. The pricing seems incredibly complex. Oh, it is. Airlines use these really sophisticated, dynamic pricing models. They charge premiums for flexibility, obviously. But sometimes you find weird deals, like it being cheaper for two people flying together than one. How does that even work? It's all about maximizing revenue, predicting demand, segmenting customers. It makes it really hard for you, the consumer, to predict prices. It's a constant game. Feels like it. Okay, a much tougher story now. South Africa, the illegal gold miners trapped underground. Yeah, the Zamazamas. It's just harrowing. It highlights the sheer desperation that drives people into incredibly dangerous, unregulated work. The article mentioned George and Alfred trapped for weeks. Three weeks, yes. And the rescue attempts themselves are often informal, incredibly risky operations run by other miners. It just underscores the extreme poverty and the human cost when formal employment isn't an option for people. A stark reminder. Okay, on a perhaps slightly less dire note, but still a challenge for some. Fine dining reservations. Getting into places like Carbone is apparently a quest. Huh. Yes, the demand for certain high-end restaurants is off the charts. It's become this whole mini economy of its own. People use concierge services, bots, third-party apps, paying just for the chance to get a table. It's not just about the food anymore. It's about exclusivity, status, the experience. It reveals this hidden market driven purely by high demand and limited supply. Fascinating. And finally, something more aesthetic. Ikea's new textiles, mm -hmm. inspired by different cultures. Yeah, drawing on historical designs, global motifs. It's interesting how they try to blend that with sustainability, making design relatively accessible. It shows how global influences filter down into everyday things we buy. Right. Okay, let's move into some perhaps unexpected insights as we wrap up. Probiotics. Are they actually good for us? The evidence seems mixed. It is mixed. There's definitely growing research linking our gut microbiome, the bacteria in our gut, to all sorts of health outcomes, mental health, immunity, digestion. That link seems pretty solid. Okay. But the evidence for specific probiotic supplements fixing specific problems, that's often still developing or maybe hyped up. What experts generally agree on is that a diverse diet, rich in fiber, is probably the best thing for your gut health overall. So maybe hold off on the expensive yogurts unless you have a specific reason. Or at least don't expect miracles. The science is still evolving. Got it. And even the weather tells a story. Britain's unusually warm July in 2025 apparently led to a rise in melanoma cases. Yeah, it's a direct 
tangible health impact linked to weather patterns, which inevitably connects to the broader climate change discussion. It makes abstract climate data feel very real and personal. These aren't just isolated heat waves, they have consequences. Definitely. Now, here's one I found really interesting. The word pengji in China, its meaning has shifted dramatically. It's fascinating, isn't it? It used to mean comrade, a standard term in the revolutionary era. Right. Then it became a colloquial, somewhat informal term for gay people. And now, apparently in some circles, it's even used as a term of derision or insult. Wow. So one word reflects huge social and political changes. Exactly. It's like a linguistic fossil record mm -hmm. of China's incredibly rapid transformations over the last few decades. Language is always evolving, but that's a particularly stark example. And finally, Mongolia, trying to preserve its ancient horse culture. Yes, horses are just so central to Mongolian identity, history, their whole way of life for centuries. Mm -hmm. But modernization, urbanization... They put immense pressure on those traditional nomadic lifestyles. So it's a struggle to keep it alive. It really is. It's a poignant example of that global tension between preserving cultural heritage and embracing the forces of modernity. Wow. Yeah. We've certainly covered a lot of ground from, I mean, the future of AI and digital money to the human cost of conflict and social shifts, right down to airline pricing and IKEA fabrics. It's quite the range. Our goal was to pull out those key nuggets for you, the listener, to help you feel informed without being totally overwhelmed. I think we've hit on some really crucial points. I agree. It really shows how interconnected everything is. You can't just look at AI in isolation or geopolitics or social trends. They all influence each other. Looking beyond the headlines, connecting those dots, that's really the key in today's world. Absolutely. So here's a final thought for you to ponder. As information just keeps coming faster and faster, changing all the time, how can you best pick out those truly important nuggets that shape our world? And what will you choose to explore next in your own deep dive? 